So I'm very happy to start this afternoon session by introducing our next speaker, Shabna Musavi. Uh, she is a fellow of the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin. Um, so she draws on doctorates in both economics and statistics to research aspects of human choice behavior. That's her broader project. Uh, currently, she's the president of the Society for the Advancement of Behavioral Economics and editor-in-chief of the journal Mind and Society. Um, she's currently writing a book entitled Fast and Frugal Decision Making, and her paper for today is Framing Human Action in Physics, Valid Reconstruction, Invalid Reduction. And um, I'll also introduce Justin Mutter, who will be responding to her. He's an assistant professor of family medicine and geriatric medicine at, here at UVA at the School of Medicine, and he's also a visiting fellow at the Institute. He serves as a core faculty for the School of Medicine Center for Health, Humanities, and Ethics. His scholarship focuses on historical political economy of aging, philosophy of clinical judgment, and person-centered care, and social histories of regulatory medicine. And with that, thank you. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for um, being here after that wonderful lunch. Um, so today, what we heard so far was about how people whom we are studying are being treated or then um, understood in terms of what their brains are doing or what other things that is a spirit and of higher faculty can do to them. I am not going to talk about people. I am going to talk about uh, scientists and very specifically social scientists. Uh, not about people. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, as the subject matter, you know, I mean, kind of uh, <laughs> point of it. Um, hey, we're people too. <laughs> <laughs> you have to earn it just <laughs> I, I seriously doubt that whenever I'm left to my... <laughs> Whenever I'm left to my own devices in the real world, I can only survive inside academia. <laughs> um, and neuroscientists are a group inside this social scientist who would model in the very way that the rest of social science is modeling, all of it roughly emanating from mathematical economics. Mm -hmm. That's how we model behavior. That's how all those findings and understandings and insights that we're talking about when it comes to uh, analyzing human behavior and their interactions and whatever it is that forms and shapes the policies are produced, it's through that formalization and models. And I'm going to talk about the structure of that modeling and the steps that we take and how we can potentially take a different view and then avoid the harms that we are doing when we take ourselves maybe too seriously. There's someone who said we are very snobbish and we do all of those things. Maybe, maybe that can be somehow helped. For that, I invite you to... This should move me somewhere. Oh, sorry. No, that's my fault. I didn't turn it on. Uh-huh. I, I, I invite you to limit yourself for the time that I am presenting this work to you to this frame. A frame where the phenomena that I'm picturing here have something in common. The first one shows you jars with marbles on them that have been shaken in order to hold the maximum number of marbles. The second one is a nematode worm, specifically the nervous system. This is the simplest brain structure that I can offer that has nodes and then connections. Then you come down, that is 
a baseball player who's trying to catch a ball that's coming from up high, a fly ball. And the last one is just iron fillings in an electronic magnetic field. What do they have in common? Yes, please, from psychology. Well, they're all maximizing something. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> or at least that is the way we, when we model them, frame them to be doing. And that is the point that I want to speak to. We are modeling all of these observed phenomena as if someone is optimizing something. And the problem starts right here. Do we need someone to actually do something? So what I am really talking about is, what is action? The summary of my argument goes like this, and we, again, as a model, as a scientist, we model from higher faculties down. So we look at what is immediately observable. I'm a person, I have so many different faculties, so many properties, I'm of course different from a ball or an iron feeling, and you don't think about me like that. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that is a serious, serious problem. And, uh, but, but look, I'm thinking about the spirit and the mind and all these important personality aspects and inclinations and powers and cognitive abilities and then the brain power, ooh, you name it. And in terms of these, I understand something. And then I move further down and I go to, oh, maybe I also need to talk about what the chemicals are doing in my brain or in my body. And then I go, further down and I think about, well, it's only probably just a response to a stimulus. But when, as an honest modeler, I want to model this, all I do is that I draw on physics. Why do I do that? Because the math is already there, it's developed. I don't have any better form of a structure than that. What is the peril here? When I move back, and put my hat on as the social scientist who was interested in this behavior that was now modeled by mathematical physics, I overextend whatever I have delivered or derived from mathematics. And then all sorts of criticisms would come our way. Hey, you're maximizing, but maximization is not proper for human behavior. We know that no human can actually do maximization. What are you talking about? Those are machines that do maximization. They're cognitively limited. They're so limited, I can get tired. I can just, I mean, if, if, if something, if, if I had a splinter in my hand now, I would have been a much worse speaker. <laughs> You're talking about cost-benefit? Yeah, the calculation is clear. But are you really sure that we know how to calculate the cost and the benefit? And that generates a lot of literature. Oh, no, it's really bad. We shouldn't do maximization because we don't know what the cost is and what the benefit is. What else? We were talking about good parenting and all the other things that technology gives us, and then um, I have a confession to make. I'm actually trained as an engineer. So we are all about efficiency. <laughs> and then when it comes to human behavior, we are using the mathematics that engineers like a lot. But then when you speak of efficiency, the question quickly becomes, and I, I was discussing with uh, my friend Saras here from uh, York, Darden School, <laughs> uh, in the past two days. So what really is efficiency when it comes to humans? We don't know. And then you go to politics. And they say, really? You're talking about efficiency? Talking to me about efficiency? I have to get those people's votes. They care about fairness. So what is fairness now? How do I make that balance? And then you suddenly see all the arguments that comes out of the mouths of politicians until recently. <laughs> is about this balance and trade-off between fairness and efficiency. Is it more efficient to do this? Is it more fair to do that? We really, really have to give up some of the fairness here. Oh, we have to be less efficient there. 
And this structures all of our debates. And it is not innocent, and it is not because it's natural, it is because of the way we have modeled. It is because it is coming out of that mechanics that we used to model the observed phenomena for the brain, for catching the ball, for the marbles, and for everything else between and outside in the world. So what is the way out? What the framework that I'm introducing today, which is joint work with my very dear colleague at Yale, Shyam Sundar, is so simple that when we started thinking about it, it was almost, uh, really? How far can we take this? It's really, really simple kind of trick, if you want to call it. But it solves a whole lot of these problems, just with that simple trick. So let's take a look at the big picture, the big picture of scientific inquiry. How do we do things? Well, we can have this division. We start with the domains. It can be the domain of animate world, mix of animate, inanimate, kind of in between, and then inanimate world. And I put it exactly in this order because I told you that when we are in social science, we start with the animate level. So what is the discipline? Social science is animate. Biology, molecular chemistry, et cetera, would be kind of on both sides. And then physics and chemistry are inanimate. The subject matter, we talk about people, group, institution. They are all animate. Animate, inanimate, cells, organisms, also groups, but colonies in other forms or other aspects of them. In inanimate, it would be only matter and energy. The principles and concepts, you have theory of mind here, for instance, which is one of the topics that we are tackling in this clip, right? Or perception and cognition, we talked about it. And then we have in economics, of course, demand and supply. We talk about behavior, labor, capital, trade, contract, judgment, personality development, state, society, culture. Culture is a tricky one, so I didn't actually write it. I don't <laughs> <see> it. <laughs> For the middle layer, we talk about evolution, we talk about matching, we talk about how there is a trade off between longevity and reproduction. We talk about anatomy, physiology. I had this really fascinating debate recently with um, a scientist from Cambridge about, he, and, and he was telling me over and over that it's all about physiology, that just, just throw away psychology and everything else you learn from this cognitive psychologist, it's all about the physiology, which is the topic that you are uh, tackling. And then we have DNA, RNA, cell, protein, what is it that you have in your brain that you can now look at with this fMRI and, and the EEG and all those, basically for me, another hat that I have is a statistician. Mm -hmm. Basically the p-values. I, mean, I, I go to, I daily am talking, walking, having lunch, meeting with neuroscientists. So brain people, neuroeconomists, all those fMRI uh, people, and what they tell me is that, oh, this part of the brain does that, that part of the brain does this, and it's heating up, and this part is cold, and that is red, and this is yellow. And I keep looking at it, and I say, you mean p-value, 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 p-value? Where is the power? And oh, that power is really low. <laughs> so that's how the conversation, I mean, that's the summary of the conversation. <laughs> but what is, what is really happening in my brain when you give me a marshmallow? Or in any general form, when you are imposing on your subject the cost-benefit in terms of rewards and punishment, and then looking at their brain, is such a small, limited domain of what we actually do in the world, that overextending those results to anything, including the most important task of bearing our next generation, sounds completely weird to me. 
So, now I come down to inanimate, an and I'm very comfortable there, trained as an engineer, always a math buff, enjoyed mathematics. Whenever in doubt, just do math. <laughs> That's my motto. I'm very happy there because everything can be clear. And I will take one of the most general principles from mathematical physics. That's the principle of least action. You have come across it somehow, somewhere. People always will tell you that things in the world will sort out themselves somehow <coughs> so that the lowest level of energy would be attained. We finally and ultimately do things in a way. So Feynman famously said, the photon, when it is choosing where to go, <laughs> sniffs <laughs> and finds the path of least action. So that's what I will be talking about today, and that is all I will be talking about today, the path of least action. And then I want to know if I take this very basic, but overly general principle of mathematical physics and contain myself in the straitjacket of principle of least action, how much I can capture of the interesting behavior of human, let's say, and others. Okay, so the terms and concepts there would be effort, flow, motion, time, inertia, symmetry, and the shared feature that I'm interested in, as I showed you in the first picture, is just physics. I mean, nobody in this room would deny that I have, with this chair, something in common. You draw this, we fall. Mm -hmm. And this is because of grad. There's no doubt <coughs> of it. And that's the extent of my point. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's do an example because I'm standing here at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture, so I have to use my words carefully. I'm speaking of altruism. How do you model altruism? Hmm? Some cultures are altruistic, some other cultures are actually pretty mean. Oh, they don't even want to share their organs after they die. That was the origination of behavioral economics, by the way. But that is for another time. So, <laughs> So how do we model altruism? We start from the observables. That is the animate part. We say there is sociological or social attributes, and people have certain inclinations, and therefore they show this altruistic tendencies. And then we say, well, but you know, we look at different species and we look at different types of people and groups of people. And then we have these plants that are not enough for giving awards to all our subjects in our experiments and field studies. So we actually move to other countries where you can give them the equivalent of one year salary <laughs> with, with the same fund because, because that grant won't be able to pay, for instance, Americans for, for one year. And, and then that won't be credible for economists. And then we see, oh, there are so many other elements involved here. Right? For instance, evolution. There is the evolutionary power, and it is in me. And then I gradually from there would go down from psychology and sociology and culture and all of that to, oh, maybe there is something in their hardware that I don't consciously know about. And then, oh, it's kind of chemistry. Like if you have been smoking this or drinking that or growing up under a lot of sun or without it, then you do this or that. And then, and then finally, I will sit down back in my office behind the desk and use the mathematical physics. It's what we're doing when we want to model altruism. OK. And this is the end of my presentation because this does not. Oh, no, no. <laughs> it is not. What do I need to point the computer? I think it's stuck in the search bar. Yeah, I see it up there. So, oh. Do you have any idea what to do? Yeah. Killer is on here. Okay, so after this, I want to do an exercise actually to see what it means to think about 
these different layers of animates, kind of in between, and then inanimates. And how would this order actually matter? Is what do you Now look, all the eyes are highlighted. Yeah, it's searching for us. Is that, ah, is that the exercise? <laughs> what happened? All the eyes are highlighted. So there you go. Ooh. I don't. Is it moving? No, it's not. It's still typing in the. Yeah, yeah I think there must be an no, arrow. You see it's stuck in the search bar. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. You, you see it's stuck in the search bar. Computer. Yeah. So. The point is here, if I limit myself into the physical of structure, what would be different then in terms of the modeling? I am not saying not yeah. OK. Is that good? There it is. That's okay. So next one, please. If I'm a good scientist and I want to do some formal work, I have to start with the definition. So now I give you the definition of action. I said, all I'm talking about today is action. Action is just a movement. Movement from point A to point C. Think about the last thing you did. Can you imagine it as moving from A to B? Which is what we are unable to do here. <laughs> 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 no? We're stuck on A. <laughs> the presentation is stuck on B. So, more specifically, if you're an economist, you can think about, oh, how did I decide to buy my last cell phone? If you're a psychologist, think about, oh, there are emotions and there are bonds between friends. Can you think about that in terms of moving from A to B? A biologist. Can you think about your production or mating as moving from point A to point B? You are a philosopher. Can liberty, free will, intention, purpose be thought of as moving from A to B? And if you are in physics, think literally about anything you want. It already is a movement from A to B. But that is the simplest definition of action that you have ever come across. It is trumping the definition that Savage established in 1954 when he was developing the subjective expected utility theory, which is now the crown and the foundation and everything in between of what we do when we formalize human behavior. Because in that, he had probabilities, he had outcomes, he needed the structures. He wanted motivation. I don't need any of those things. I'm just saying it's a movement. Action is a movement from A to B. Why am I doing this? Because I want to be valid when I go to my physics. I don't want to use my mathematical physics beyond where they actually apply. Can I go to the next one, please? OK. So this is an exercise. PLA is the principle of least action. What it tells you is like with every other physics rule or formal rule will tell you. I need to express, and, and when you do, for instance, a regression, it's the same thing. Whenever you're working with data, it's the same thing. I need to know what is external. So it can be considered as given or input. I need to know what is my dependent variable, if it's a stat model or an empirical model, or in physics we call it, in the principle of least action, the action element. So on action element, I am then doing my optimization. And finally, if I am framing my problem in the principle of least action, the outcome would be a path. And that's how I understand it. The proper action, oops, did I just say that? In physics, we don't have intent. Uh, there is nothing to be proper. It's just what is. Yeah? OK. So what is, eventually, when that photon sniffs in Feynman's world, 
there's a path of least action that would have, for instance, a king if the medium of the environment changes, say from sun to go under the water. I'm going to capture two of the live phenomena that I showed you in the first picture in this framework, just telling you what the element of action is, what the given elements or outside action elements are, and what the path would be. I also compare for you why does it matter if I am staying inside the physics, whereas how we are doing it now in social science, in economics, in quantitative psychology, and I am not knowledgeable enough to speak to the specific brand of other social sciences, but when we do this, oh, but in, in neuro, when we do this models. So the method of modeling for catching a fly ball, which is a very dear problem. So for instance, when um, Richard Hawkins was uh, writing Selfish Gene, he also had this problem in the center. When the ball player is catching the fly ball, it's as if he's calculating it in the back of his head. Right? And the cognitive psychologist would say, oh, you missed it. I think there's a simple heuristic at work that is drawing on capacities from evolution. And I'm, I'm a simple engineer, so I would just say, if I had a machine and I wanted it to do the same thing like the dog that is catching the frisbee, what would it do? keeps the angle of gaze constant, which translates to changes in that angle would be minimized, ideally zero, but because it's a dynamic problem, just minimize that. Then that would be my action element. I am minimizing something. And I don't need anything else. I don't need an intention. I don't need evolution capacities. I don't need a homogenous factor that is calculating the path for me, nothing, none of those. All of those problems are now out of the window. Because I am in the physics and I'm minimizing an element. As soon as I specify the element, everything else is out. So the current method says, I am thinking about the brain, evolutionary capacity, and then I go to catching the ball. Our proposed method says, I'm in the physics, I only need to tell you what is given. Well, time that the ball will come down to a height, say about one and a half meter that I can catch it, is given, so it's outside, I have nothing to do with it. The path, all of those things that the ball takes is also outside. How do I do it? That's my action element. Well, in the current case, we are drawing a lot on the evolution, on the gaze. But I just say, keep a fixed angle. And then the path would be a curved path. And by the way, notice that our proposed method is not changing all parts that are associated with the existing practice. So I have same as above, same as above in both places. What about the nervous system in a nematode worm? In the nematode worm, you can have 40 million different ways of connecting the nodes in that simple, simple, simplest nervous system in order for the creature to become functional, to pass a message from one side to the other through neurons. And only one of them has actualized. So the optimizing nature has ended up with that, what they call a save wire in biology to come up with this configuration. Do I need that? No, I can just say, I'm only staying in physics. I'm thinking about the number of ganglia, which is already given to me, so I have nothing to do about it. And I am only minimizing the distance, the total distance between the nodes. And the path that will come out, which has a fiber connection, which be a, will be a minimal length total, and it's the same in both cases. So, so what? 
Let me go back to the difference between the actor, the people, busy of trying to theorize and model, and us as modelers. So the framework that I have just offered, and then I gave a definition of action for, can be worked at from two sides, like every other modeling that we do when we come out of physics, because we are also the subject matter. From the viewpoint of our subject matter, which is also us, which is the actor, what happens now is that, based on my definition of action, which was, and I can go back, an action is a movement from state A to state B, where A and B are or are not specified by the actor, not by the modeler, because the modeler knows it all, a pair of beginning end states would constitute a situation, like a path that I end up. So what can I have? I can have this table that says the beginning is a specified or non-specified, the end is a specified or non-specified, and an interesting thing comes out of this simplest definition of action. You name any action you're interested in, I tell you which bin, I'll drop it in. And, and that is extremely succinct, but also very functional. So the one that I am very excited about would be when the beginning is not specified, but the end is specified. And what is that? My wishes my dreams. How so? I have a very clear picture. I want to be the Queen of Scotland. Oh, wait a minute. Scotland doesn't help us if it's Queen these days. But anyways, I want to be that. That's my wish. It's my dream. I, I, I'm capable of making that wish. Right? It's a wish. It has no constraints. As long as I have made it, a step towards it, it remains in that bin. What happens to it when I specify the beginning? The end is completely specified, right? I can even share it with you. As soon as I specify the beginning by bringing an army together, or in modern world, race fund, maybe to crowdsource. <laughs> <laughs> then, it is no longer here. Where would it go? It would go exactly where I was talking to you about. It will be in the domain of beginning is specific, end is specific, and so I can just model it simply with physics. I no longer have any need for other levels. All the money can be calculated properly. I can use all the tools that I have in my arsenal as a mathematician. Done. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay. So, since we have social scientists here, then I talk about this cell. The specified beginning, non-specified end. And this would be everything we do under the big umbrella of Decision making under risk and uncertainty. But how do you do it? Do you really do it here? Is any action happening here? No. As soon as I model, I am back here. Why? Because I reduce my uncertainty to some calculable probability. We never stay here. And then I also have the story to tell about the habits and customs and rituals and also about the big hallmark of behavioral economics, which is default options and all of that. But I only have five minutes. So, <coughs> What are the gains in terms of methodology when I take this approach? One gain is that I will just stay away from the debate over whether optimization is proper or not for analyzing human behavior. 
Because I am not even making any claims about anything above the physics of human being. I am not searching for causality, intention, purpose, none of those things. By remaining in physics, I am extending the power of physics in terms of explanation, but also limiting myself in terms of the claims and the explanatory power that it can have. The second one is a favorite amongst people who have been doing modeling at both macro and micro levels. So for instance, Arrow talks, uh, uh, Kenneth Arrow talks about methodological individualism, all the way to people in philosophy of science, like um, Helen Langino says that everything that behavioral scientists are doing has the pitfall of methodological individualism. Because you start modeling and conceptualizing the entire society and societal phenomena based on that individual with certain specified properties. Now, in the way that I used my tools of modeling, that problem does not exist anymore. There is no intention to be worried about. There is no definition. There is no specific property beyond what I share with this chair when I'm talking about the individual. The logical individualism obviated. But I am not a reductionist. But if I were a reductionist, I would say, when I broke it down to these physical properties, then I can build it back up. It's all in there, but I'm not saying that. When you move up, there is something else. All I'm saying is that the laws of physics do not apply to the whole thing when you move up higher to the chemicals of the brain and the spirit and the personality, etc. So, what happens when we are talking about the physical phenomena versus the social phenomena? Social physics has an old tradition. It has been very tempting. The entire, I don't know, Cold War era was built on this, okay, this side we have people who don't do central planning, on the other side, we have people who do central planning and really believe in it. How was central planning planned based on social physics? Do we still do social physics? Uh, wait a minute. What are behavioral economists doing these days? Mm -hmm. And all those psychologists who are consulting the government, they are kind of doing this central planning. But they are not doing it in terms of pure social physics. They're drawing on something else, let's say psychological inclinations. So what, sorry. So the observation effect as it exists in physics, it exists also in the social phenomena. Who is looking matters. Are the principles universal? For physics, they are. So as long as I say there, I'm good. For society, they don't. Are the methods neutral? No, they are not. Neither for physics, nor for the society. And about the explanation or explanatory power, we have equivalence when it comes to physics. So I can do it in many different ways and then show that they are not different because they are logically or mathematically equivalent, which is a big confusion in social sciences these days. We keep talking about how people are irrational because they are confusing two completely equivalent situations. Guess what? At the social phenomenon level, those explanatory equivalences don't hold any longer. We think they are a problem because we use our physical tools. So what we're offering is a new order. And Machiavelli, who is the super uber policy advisor, <laughs> said there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in success 
than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order in things, which I dare to do kind of today. And my last quote would be from Philip Anderson, so the physicist of Princeton, who wrote a paper in 47, More is Different. And more is different, he doesn't stay with this field of Christology when he's talking about what reductionism is and what reconstructionism is. And he says one is absolutely valid in physical phenomena, the other one isn't, which is, by the way, the other way in social sciences. But he wants to give us insight that goes way up to the society level. The ability to reduce everything to simple fundamental laws does not imply the ability to start from those laws and reconstruct the universe. In fact, the more the elementary particle physicists tell us about the nature of the fundamental laws, the less relevance they seem to have to the very real problem of the rest of science, much less to those of society. So if I may sum up, the frame I gave you was put you in this, I invited you mm -hmm. to enter in this frame with me and look at what all these phenomena have in common in terms of their physics when I'm even looking at the brain or some deliberate action. And what the message is, is that we must tame our techniques, not throw them away. At the same time, we should curb our claims. But how to do it still remains a very technical matter. And for that, I offered the beginning. Yes, yeah. this is a project in progress of a method. And the method is, let's just reverse the order. Instead of going from high faculties down to physical existence, start with physical existence, use the laws of physics, when you move up to biology, Optimization still can work the role of an organizer, but it needs a mending with biological laws, and the explanatory power decreases and has flaws, and there's no puzzle in the observations that when you go even above biology to the social level, human phenomena, that the explanatory power of optimization becomes <coughs> very, very small. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Well, I have to say, I, I, uh, I don't often find myself sub quoting Machiavelli, but um, <laughs> I think the only thing harder than trying to do uh, what uh, what you're trying to do, Professor Misavi, is in this uh, really fascinating paper is to respond to what you're trying to do with this new order. So I will, I'll do my best. I'm neither a uh, behavioral economics uh, expert nor a, a uh, theoretical physicist, but, um, but there's some fascinating things about about this this modeling that you're trying to to do and this uh, methodological approach. I mean, first of all, what just struck me was uh, appreciating the desire to really move beyond our straitjacket of uh, using the natural sciences and that pure sort of animate inanimate space uh, to do our modeling. Um, so really appreciated that. And, and um, uh, at the end of uh, Professor Masabi's paper, um, she has this great line, um, she, we want to promote a careful observation of the orders in which scientific insights are produced. Like, oh, yes, that would be great. Um, so, um, but, but I want to go back to, um, you know, and certainly the, the, the power of, uh, of what you're proposing here can have so, uh, really incredible impact uh, just in my own field um, and the ways in which other methodologies, including methodological individualism, are, um, are alive and well, um, we, we are seeing uh, so much of behavioral economics and, and medicine, for example, um, 
where even with things like uh, payment reform and, and uh, things like uh, theorizing medical error, um, there um, are lots of ways in which certain kinds of modeling are being done that could be very risky if we get it if we get it wrong. So I think that this this project really has um, incredible impact. But I want to go back to um, uh, something you said about your methodology that is very succinct but also very functional. Um, and uh, just sort of start with an invitation, like a thought experiment to to move along those functional lines and then have a couple questions related to that. Um, and that's just uh, for us to try to walk through. Uh, in your in your paper, you have this nice uh, diagram that wasn't in your slides about uh, the core to the so core to crust. Uh, so like, so uh, the idea for those of you um, uh, who haven't seen it uh, is that at, at the core here, uh, we have mathematical physics, and then we're moving to the crust in this um, way of. Um, of modeling uh, social action, um, all the while being very aware of the fact of, um, uh, of that we are observers um, of these processes and of our own methodologies. Um, but I want to talk about how that then is um, becomes functional, and particularly through the um, principle of least action, um, because it did seem to me uh, that you are positing that there is a sort of hierarchical way in which we should move, that we start with um, at the level of uh, mathematical physics and then um, move to those um, further tiers up uh, toward the crust. Um, and I, I was trying to figure out, I was trying to just think of examples either from my own field or, or other uh, realms of social action, domains of social action, uh, where this would be functional. Um, and uh, there was a nice kind of uh, point in your, in your paper, um, you didn't mention it in your presentation, but uh, the example of two points in a gra gravitational field, two ends, right? And so it's not about the causality, as you, as you said, um, with the photons, it's, it's about there's, a, there's this kind of movement, a primary action that's going on. Um, but how then do we say, move from those two points to four points, and then those four points to six points, and then those six points all the way up to a million points, um, uh, and sort of not involve some of those other tiers of inquiry, um, whether they be the biological sciences or the social sciences. Um, and in that sort of thought experiment, as I'm trying to think about how to functionalize or operationalize uh, your methodology. Um, I, I, I was, was I'm glad that um, this morning we, we brought up uh, children and play and, and things like that, because I kept coming, trying to think of examples. And um, uh, I was thinking about my five-year-old who, who never cleans up. And um, so you know, trying to model this social action of an adult who's in a room of kindergartners and says, clean up your toys. And like, what, what happens? Like, because there's something that happens very physically in that space where we would start at the core here. Um, but, um, but it seems like there's, uh, it, A, it's suboptimal <laughs> what, what happens, right? Um, but, then, um, but then B, uh, there's also, a way in which um, the principle of least action does not seem to uh, work there. Um, right? Like a room full of kindergartners, it's going to be more sort of chaos than, uh, than this principle of least action, at least in the, at the, even at the sort of physical level of, of what happens in that room. Um, and so I was trying to figure out um, how sort of that, um, how that question uh, leads us back to the issues of, of, of two real things, and I'll just leave it here. First of all, um, this question of optimization and the principle of least action, I think, is really fascinating and really important. Um, do we have to fully leave that behind um, as we move up our tiers? Um, because we are inevitably going to be getting uh, into suboptimal uh, relationships uh, and suboptimal movements. The, the ball catcher who doesn't catch the ball, 
for example. Um, um, and then second, um, this question that you, this very nice sort of layering that you had um, from core to crust, um, because I found myself as I was trying to think about the physical space of things like the room full of kindergartners, um, I found myself envisioning it more as like a Venn diagram of like, you've got your social sciences, your biological sciences, your physical sciences, and it's all kind of in there all at once, right? Not in a layered uh, sort of methodological way, but we're all talking to one another at the same time, trying to figure out what's happening in this room and that sort of social action. Um, and so those, those two questions that I just wanted to highlight, um, how to think of, about functionalizing optimization and uh, whether th suboptimal things, phenomena do exist uh, in this model. Uh, and then also how then, we, um, how then we think about layering and how we think about the crossovers between the categories that you had on those very nice um, uh, slides um, and the sort of tangents between them.